Uh, hello and welcome to the Convergence of Divergence panel discussion where we are going to be treated to a conversation about neurodivergence with a panel of experts in the fields of education, nonprofits, mental health, and the sale of pianos in St. George. <laughs> Ouch. Uh, <laughs> Ouch. Gosh, I might have stolen that from a presentation you gave. Okay, good. All right. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Dr. Nate, and I'm the founder and CEO of StudyZen, an app that helps kids with ADHD organize their schoolwork in a way that best suits their strengths. I started down this path 12 years ago, not really knowing I was starting on a path at all, and it wasn't until I was sitting in a room with my daughter as she was being diagnosed, and the doctor started to recommend everything that I had taught my university students a decade earlier to do, that it clicked, that this tool that I created for myself during my doctoral program was the tool that helped me wrangle my ADHD. And, uh, and I went and showed it to him, and he thought it was a great idea to develop. Uh, so here we are, uh, just over a year later, uh, starting to bring that to market. But it took 10 years for that to click. I, and I mean, I am slow. You ask you know, some of my friends, you know, they, they know I'm slow. I've been blessed with the gift of naivety, and it keeps me out of a lot of trouble sometimes. Um, but I realized after working in the tech arena for about 10 years that we spend an awful lot of our, our creative capital, our innovation capital, that comes from our collective neurodivergence in the thick of thin things. We, try, we, we chase all kinds of incremental business improvements and then we go home spent and try to help our kids who are struggling and we try to implement the same old things that we've done all the time. But what would happen if we brought our innovation sector together with the needs of our students? What could happen for them? That's, that's the answer that we're trying to chase. And that's why we have this panel here today. Um, just some quick intros of everybody here. I'm going to go kind of out of order. I probably should have told you to sit in the specific order, but that's OK. Um, Ryan Erickson here is uh, second to my right, is the COO of Kids on the Move, which is a Utah nonprofit that provides services throughout Utah to support families with young children with special needs. Kids on the Move has an umbrella of um, independent operating pillar programs that serve, uh, the programs are, the Autism Center, Early Head Start, Early Intervention, Preschool and Child Care, and Respite Care. Dr. Amon Cheney, on the end, is an ADHD certified clinical services provider. Since 2018, he has worked as a therapist at Utah Valley University, where he has been involved in the treatment and assessment for ADHD, as well as providing informational ADHD workshops. Joshua Brothers, or Mr. Brothers, as the kids at his school call him, is an award-winning educator, school administrator, and thought leader from Salt Lake City. He specializes in school and classroom cultures that connect teachers and students through strong and compassionate leadership. He also gave an amazing presentation at TEDx, Salt Lake City, called Compassionate Educators Know There Are No Bad Dogs, and I highly recommend you go view that. Our last panelist needs no introduction, so I won't introduce him. Oh, thank you. <laughs> save some time. Uh, no, you guys all know him. He's recorded with Snoopy, Lightsabers, and at four of the seven wonders of the world. That's right, four of the seven. Four of the seven, and atop a couple of them. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Stephen Sharp Nelson is the cellist of the world-famous group The Piano Guys. From every stage, he credits his creative superpower, ADHD, encouraging people worldwide with this same gift, especially kids, to embrace their superpower. And I'll just say personally, he has moved mountains to be here uh, with us today. So we really appreciate it. Please welcome them to the stage. All right, now I, I did send all of these questions to the panel beforehand, but I learned today that not everybody had time to look at them. So some of this may be off script, a little from the hip, and that's how we like it. <laughs> All right, so for the first question is for everybody, and you'll each get a chance to, to, you know, uh, to address this one. In the description of this session, we use the words disruptive innovator. 
as both a positive in the work world and a negative in the classroom. What can we do as a business, education, or professional community to encourage innovative problem solving in our children while not overwhelming teachers and educators? Who wants to tackle that first? Why don't we start with Dr. Cheney? I love that question. Um, one of the things I talk to students most about is avoiding the comparison trap. And driving here, I was just thinking, who gave you, Stephen, the permission to take this course as a musician? Like, I think of musicians becoming teachers, you know, probably having to have a full-time job while they sit at a in a symphony or something like that. And you were playing, you know, I saw you with Alex Boyer on top of some canyon spire, right? That's right. <laughs> it was extreme cello. Years ago. That's so different. And you using your own study skill to start off a career and, and move in that direction. Um, we've got to be able to allow kids to not compare themselves to others and do their own thing, um, to feel strong and empowered to um, be different. One of my soapboxes is with students that, uh, gosh, 10 years doing therapy with students, they come in and they tell me they're procrastinators. Mm -hmm. And um, I can't think of a single time somebody, I, immediately after that I ask, um, how do you like your grades? Oh, my grades are fine. You know, I, I get some C's, maybe a B but here and there, but mostly A's, almost all the time. And I say, well, what if you don't call it procrastinating and, and you do what you want and you say you work well under pressure? And not comparing themselves to how everybody else is doing it, I think opens a lot of doors for kids when they realize they can do that. I appreciate that. Thank you. Josh? Sure. Joshua? Mr. Um, I think we're seeing, a, over the last 10 years, a real shift starting to happen, not just in the universities, but then down through high schools and middle schools and elementary schools. Um, and the way that that shift is taking a look at is, A, we're becoming more fluent in the language of, um, of the brain. Of the brain. Um, understanding uh, what neurodivergency means, how that can bring strengths into the classroom, but at the same time that we're allowing our educators to have a little bit more flexibility. Um, and, and that changes from state to state because I've met teacher, teachers that are coming in from other states and there are some districts where your curriculum is handed to you, this is what you deliver, and if you deviate from that then you can go and work someplace else because that's not what we do here. And um, so we've got these two sides that are kind of battling with each other because they, there's a desire to have this deliverable. By the end of the year, kids are able to do these things. Um, but without that flexibility, we're not taking into account the human element that's in the classroom. And what I've been really pleased to see, especially in schools in the Utah area, um, is more of a movement towards what's called universal design learning. And what that does is it allows flexibility for students to demonstrate mastery of a task. And that can come through a lot of different methods. And this was something that um, when I was in the classroom, I really loved doing um, when I just have a skill that I want you to demonstrate. And that skill can be demonstrated through a variety of different tasks that you can choose the one that's gonna be best fitted to you and that draws the interest to you. And that actually made things more interesting for me as an educator too, because I wasn't taking home a crate of papers <laughs> you know, on a weekend and reading and, and just like grading them and banging my head against my you know, desk because I had made the mistake of telling everybody to give me the same mediocre thing. And when you allow that space for students to really uh, show you what they can do and show how their brain is working and looking at the problem, um, you get some really beautiful things from that. And I think the more that we can encourage that, um, we'll actually see less of the disruption in our classrooms because the kids are gonna be more engaged, they're gonna, more, they're gonna be like being there. Um, and they're going to be liking the work that they're producing, or on the other side of that, they're going to be desiring to work harder to produce better work because of that. Thank you. And, and I do have to say that, uh, that um, when I sent the questions to the panel, there was only one of the panelists who corrected 
formatting and grammar on it. I'll give you a guess who that was. It was it, me. It's, <laughs> it's in his DNA. Once, a, once an English teacher, always a teacher. <laughs> Did he give you a grade on the questions? <laughs> Thankfully, no. Oh, sheesh. No grade on that one. Yeah. How many red lines were there? <laughs> Very few, fortunately. I remember, I only gave him a short time to review it, so. <laughs> Approaching proficient. Thank you. <laughs> Needs improvement. Story of my life. That's a creative way of saying you need a lot of help is what he's doing. <laughs> no, I just kidding. That's a really good question, and I think of it, the disruptive part. I, I really like that word because you can, you're finding better ways or different ways or cost-effective ways to do things. I think of my sons. I have four boys, and then all the kids that we serve at Kids on the Move, and I think there's so many qualities that these young children have that – adults kind of frown upon, but if they were an adult, that would be an awesome quality for mm -hmm. them to have, right? Mm -hmm. But it, you're not used to having some of those things in these little kids, and so it catches you off guard. But at Kids on the Move, we do a really good job with our preschool and our child care of really meeting the children where they're at. Like, they're, every child is different, and so every child is on a different learning level, and they have different, some of these children have autism, some of them have ADHD, some of them have Down syndrome. They ha there's all these different things that they have. And so we individualize the approach and, and every one is an individualized thing because we're, we're taking it down to that level that you talked about of establishing a relationship with them, understanding where they're at and, and kind of helping them grow from where they're at. And it's really awesome to see. And so I think when you take that approach, it, disruptive is a great thing because we're just doing it in a different way. Very true, very true, thank you. Uh, speaking from the standpoint of um, living a life, striving to live a life full of creativity, I've, I've seen creativity so stymied by several things. One is that this, this whole social media enterprise that's occurred, uh, we've seen dramatic, dramatic increases in depression and uh, self-doubt, suicide rates, everything, because of this comparison thing you talked about, Ammon. So I think if we were to approach that, we're really good at, at boxes, you know, putting kids in boxes and trying to standardize everything. I understand the need for that. However, could we leverage creativity more in our classrooms? Could we make it more personal to the point where it's like, you don't need to compare yourself because you have a work to do and your creativity is unlike anybody else's creativity. How do we leverage that more? And I know it's so difficult to be so personal with every student with the class sizes that we have, but can we engage our students in creative thinking that engages them in settings where they feel like they can be 100% themselves, no need to compare, and there's positive self-talk going on? And there's that gratification of, I've created this. It doesn't fit anything else out there, like what you mentioned, Ammon, when I was on top of a cliff playing an Africanized version of a Coldplay tune. I was being myself. And nobody was grading me. Nobody had established a set curriculum for me. I had a very white palette that I got to paint on. If we could leverage that more in our classrooms, I would love to see the power of creativity put at the forefront of what we're trying to get kids to immerse themselves in. That's a great question. That's a great, that's a great response. I, I really uh, gets the wheels turning as, uh, as you are, you know, you all are addressing the same issue from different standpoints. It reminds me, uh, years ago, I was uh, working and recruiting in the technology sector, and uh, and we wanted to figure out better ways to identify talent versus just checking boxes, and uh, so I, I actually started working developing like an old school uh, Facebook app when they were a lot more friendly to individual independent developers, and um, and I started going about like this quiz approach. And uh, to, to ask the developers, like, you know, when you could challenge friends to games and you say, like, hey, beat my score at whatever. And, uh, and I started putting up these questions, and I thought, what, would it be more interesting to have the, the developer identify which of these solutions would not work versus which ones would work? Because there's always more than one way to accomplish a specific deliverable. And then I was sitting in a room, you know, fast forward half a dozen years, I was sitting in a room here, not far from here, um, where there was an industry leader that said, 
we would rather have more graduates from, from public schools who knew how to give us 10 solutions to one problem versus one way of solving 10 problems. And, and that's when it clicked. Like, that's that's the cre part of the creativity that's missing in the classroom is not just regurgitate the way that I told you to do it a hundred times, but how many creative ways can you solve this same problem? And, uh, and it's really what you all are, are talking about, understanding the individual at where they are and helping them take the next step from wherever that is. But it takes time. And it doesn't take just a therapist or an educator or a nonprofit or somebody to inspire them. It takes, I don't wanna say it takes a village, but it takes at least two people, right? It takes more than one person for sure. Um, Cause to a kid with ADHD, a village all of a sudden could be very overwhelming, right? Sure. Um, but what, let's focus that a little bit more. And this is a follow on to the same question. What can we do as parents or caregivers um, and families to help work with the educator or the therapist or wherever else they're receiving services from. How can we be better on the same page to help the child achieve those outcomes? You know, that's a, that's a good question and it is reminding me of kind of what we're doing at Kids on the Move right now because we really consider our parents as our superpower Right, they, they inspire us to do more. They inspire us in creating new programs, what we're about to do. And it, it's, all about the, it's all about the communication. First off, these parents trust us, right? Because they're seeing the impact that we have in their children's lives. But then they're willing to share with us their challenges, their experiences, what they're going through. And when you can have that open line of communication, it's kind of reminding me of Stephen Covey's book, Trust and Inspire. I don't know if any of you guys have read it. It's a great book. But you establish that trust. And when there is that trust, it really inspires people. And it, it inspires those parents to share their feelings, to be able to give us knowledge that we necessarily wouldn't have. And when you have that communication, that's when that's when change can happen. That's when you can do things. So I guess with parents, I think just if, if these educators and as, if, as these individuals and corporations can really have that opening ear and kind of let those, par let those parents feel the trust that we have, it's going to open up that communication. Can, can I bring this to a personal level? My son, Maxwell, who exhibits ADHD tendencies, which I'm very proud of. And, and I tell him every day how awesome this is and what great things he's going to do when he learns how to channel it and we're leveraging it and we're, we're trying, we're experimenting with channels. And, um, but I know I've got some really good education talent here. He struggles, 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 struggles. The school day is too long. It's just too long to him. He's burned out by the first <laughs> hour. And he gets so frustrated. He's tired. He's, he's emotional at the end of the day. He's been sitting still for too long. Uh, PE is twice a week. He's like, how come that's not five times a week? Um, I love my art class. I love my art class, but all the other classes are, they teach, they're trying to teach the, the child that, that needs the most instruction, and he is, he excels, so he gets to the point where he's completely understimulated. Uh, this is actually a legitimate yeah. question. What do I do as a parent? I want to go to the administrators or the teachers and say, can we restructure this? But then I don't want to be this prima donna, make an exception for me because my child's special. I don't want to be that anyway. So will you please give me guidance and everybody else who maybe is experiencing what I'm experiencing? I, I can relate to that. Um, my second year teaching, um, I, I got in trouble because... <laughs> I had a class um, that was, I, I had a lot of boys in that class and I had a couple of students that uh, dealt with ADHD in that class as well. And so I planned in extra recesses uh, throughout the day because that gross motor movement's just so important. And then boys in general, they just got to, they got to move, right? I was teaching, I was teaching fourth grade at the time and I got pulled aside by my administrator and they said, what are you doing? You're not using your time or, you know, like I went to your room to get you and you were not there. And um, I had, uh, and they, they weren't super long, but, you know, they were targeted right. to be enough 
a break, and we'd take the whole class outside, and it wasn't like a free-for-all recess. It was like a structured, we would, I would do obstacle courses, I would run them with them, we would wow. like, we would play games with each other. I had wow. one girl taught the entire class how to prance around like a pony on all fours. <laughs> I love and, it. and that was a good time. And so I made a deal with the administrator, and luckily I had an administrator that was, um, willing to work with me and listen mm -hmm. to my reasoning on it because I very easily could have been reprimanded, sent back, sure. and just like written up. And I asked her, I said, you give me three weeks. Mm -hmm. Three weeks of continuing to have these recesses. And if my students are showing better educational outcomes at the end of that three weeks, you let me keep doing it. Wow. Because I know, and because I, I don't necessarily say that I can force every other teacher to be doing that, but I knew that I was willing to do it. Mm -hmm. And I liked doing it, and I enjoyed my classroom more when I did that. Mm -hmm. And the kids enjoyed being in the classroom more when they had that sure, space. Sure. And so I think, like on on a big level, it it is okay. Uh, I I would advocate for that same thing. I think on a, on a larger level, in terms of like the policies that our school districts have, we need more space for that. Uh, free time, gross motor movement time, but it's very easy for a teacher to start incorporating some of that um, gross motor movement into the classroom. They, I mean, we've got, especially in elementary schools, I feel like elementary school teachers understand this a little bit more because uh, they I, give I, brain I, breaks I, a little bit more, but I would continue doing it. So when I, when I moved up to high schools, I continued doing it for my high school kids. Okay. And we would give a brain break in the middle of the class and um, that, that helped them focus so much more. Like we would stand up, we would stretch, we would maybe do a little bit of movement. And kids thought it was silly at first, but then they started noticing. And even the kids who didn't have ADHD noticed, oh, because of our brains are these blood hungry organs that are just starving for oxygen and they're just working so hard to pump it up there when we're just sitting still all the time. And there, there's a researcher out of Iceland um, who actually came to speak in Salt Lake uh, just this last summer, mm -hmm. and he said something that really stuck with me. He said, it's not that sitting, uh, it's not that movement is so good, it's that sitting is so bad, right? right? Mm -hmm. And so okay. if we can start thinking more flexibly about the way this, that our classrooms are structured, one of the things that I really love doing is working with teachers and helping them understand how they can flexibly switch their environment around, and you can, teach kids these routines where you can flexibly flip your classroom into six or seven different learning environments just by moving desks around, separating them, big circles, small groups, having them all up at the board. Right. And even that little bit of movement too mm -hmm. helps engage and makes it okay for kids to maybe be up and out of their chair. or mm -hmm. And just being flexible with how people's bodies are going to exist in this space that you are not the manager of, you are the leader of that space. Mm -hmm. And there's so many times I feel like we really, it's so much easier for teachers to live in a management space where they're controlling the environment and saying, yeah. you stay there, mm -hmm. I'm here. When the teacher is ready, the students shall appear, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> Rather than the other way around. So and I don't think that parents should shy away from Speaking asking and, and asking for those things. Right because I think the teachers, we're starting to talk about that a lot more in education, yeah, way more than we did 10 years ago. And I, I wouldn't say that parents uh, should stay silent on that topic because we're talking about it more. So he'll charge you for that session later. Oh, I'm sure oh, yeah. he will. So, I mean, yeah. send, send him an invoice. <laughs> uh, um, I really, really appreciate that. It gets the, wall, it gets the, 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 the gears moving. Uh, but I start to think about, well, what happens when they get to college and, and how do those, how does that change? Because you talk about uh, a, a teacher managing their space, a, a lot of times when you, in, when you introduce tenure uh, in, in the, the, the collegiate system, a lot of times you see drop off in proactivity in, in the classroom, not all the time, but some, sometimes, and it, it's kind of a, uh, I don't know, I, it, when I was there, it was kind of a, a, a rite of passage. Uh, if you weren't working for tenure, then why were you teaching anyways? Um, and, uh, um, and I even asked, when, it, when I was asked to, to, to you know, start putting together a tenure portfolio, which I didn't even know existed till that point, um, I asked, do, do, I, do I have to pursue tenure? 
Uh, and they said, well, yes. And, and, uh, and so I was like, I, I just don't want that. I, I, I thought of it as a crutch. Uh, and uh, you know, I don't want that, that easy out to say, I don't have to try anymore. Um, but in the college sphere, um, I mean, like, what do you see, uh, like, trends? Do you see, you see the, like you said, Josh, 10 years ago we weren't having these discussions. Now we are. But has that caught up in college? Is college ahead of that conversation to where we're thinking more about the neurodivergent needs in the classroom, not just providing services for students who, who uh, I guess, self-advocate and go seek it? Uh, I, do you see that? Because you provide services <clears throat> from a clinical perspective. And I could speak really easily to um, trends in diagnosis and, and uh, things of that nature. But I think Mariana could answer this question better. She uh, was coaching at UVU and also um, is a coach now. Can I hand it to her? Special <laughs> guest. Oh, thank, yes. Uh, thank you, Give Alan. it up for Mariana. Uh, hello. <laughs> So I yield Should my I time. Should I do a brief Ma bio? Ma <laughs> Mariana, why don't you come up here on stage because we can't actually see you on camera okay. from, from over there. Oh, I forgot. Um, this, this was semi-planned already, just so you know. Ish. She was a plant, I'm um, a plant. In, the, in the crowd. Um, <laughs> so Ammon's correct. I worked in higher education for 14 years. I am an adjunct instructor, and I was student-facing um, in advising and then as an ADHD and academic academic coach at UVU. Um, and so in terms of the trends moving forward, bringing things in like universal design, we are seeing that happening more and more. Um, I was just invited to speak at a Yushi event about inclusivity, um, diversity, inclusivity, belonging, and neurodiversity was a part of that. And so people like myself will go to conferences where we train um, and educate educators in higher ed on how to adapt these kinds of practices in their classroom with assignments and just in their teaching in general. So I have seen a shift. There's more of an awareness and an understanding and I would say like a hunger from faculty to understand these students and to understand how to support not just these students but all of, all of their students. So not just neurodivergent students but neurotypical students as well. Um, so my husband's a tenured faculty at UVU um, uh, with ADHD, and um, he and he I... He is an exception, by the he, way, to that rule. <laughs> he is. He, uh, he's award-winning. He's great. Um, but uh, he and I have teamed up over the last year and ongoing um, to do these kinds of presentations and trainings. So something I was going to add was, as a parent, m maybe reach out to these types of people and see if the school would be willing to have a professional development day where you bring in people who understand neurodivergence and understand how to better classroom practice and pedagogy um, in order to make sure that everyone's kind of on the same page with understanding, awareness, okay. um, knowledge, you know? And so that way it's, you're building it out as a cultural thing at the um, organization or institution. So that's one thing that we're seeing people are kind of wanting more, so. Yeah. Thank Is you, Mariana. Yeah, thank you. Anything to add to that, Dr. Chen? Thanks Cheney? for answering that better than I could. Um, <laughs> just because I'm not in the classrooms and right. I know you are. Um, relevant to the messages we give the kids and, and utilizing class time and, and feeling like they can stretch and take breaks when they need to, once they get to college, then I feel like I'm um, helping students recognize how to self-advocate for themselves, giving them ass assertiveness skills and internalizing a message of I deserve to learn because they haven't been used to, in many instances, feeling empowered to be different and unique and being told, you know, nobody's going to care in your classroom if you go and stand in the back of the room and stretch. You don't really have to ask permission to do that anymore. Mm -hmm. um, it, and, and then I teach them that um, you're not... Uh, ADHD isn't an inability to focus, it's an inability to stay motivated to focus. And so all we need is a little more stimulation in our brain and we can get that through um, you know, taking breaks, we can get it through stretching and, and uh, using fidgets, chewing on carrots or something during class. You get this deep joint stimulation and the key is that the stimulation doesn't compete with what you're trying to do. It's non-competitive operate in your unconscious, but it still is giving your brain some dopamine. Um, 
but students deserve to learn and uh, they need to know that it's okay to advocate for themselves, talk to a professor or, um, or submit something anonymously saying, hey, there's something about the environment that's not helpful, this group of kids talking, the window always open, whatever it is, so. Thank you, yeah, the, the most, I guess the, the most frequently recurring topic in the classroom that, that when I taught at UVU was uh, motivation. And, and so to come back to that in this ADHD sphere, um, uh, it, it, uh, it really hits on the head. Um, I, I came up with, you know, lots of people have, and Steve has as well, with my own meaning for ADHD. And, and it goes along with that. It, for me, it means attention dynamic, uh, hyper-driven, right? Um, because we don't have a, a lack of attention we have an overabundance of attention. We pay attention to this and that and that and that and that, right? All at the same time and we cycle through and we filter out and we put, put something else in, in place. And when we find something that drives us, you can't stop us. Right. And, 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 and that's what maybe it sounds like you're trying to help kids in college open that door to understand that these are strengths that, that you need to learn, like you were saying, right, with your son, to find channels where yeah. they fit. So, and I've got kids with ADHD as well, and what we do is, you know, we get these letters, your kid's disruptive in class, and I just, all right, what are we gonna try? We'll try some experiment together, because um, there's nothing wrong with you being bored in class. This is not something you love. And so, we try one experiment, see how it works, and if it doesn't work, Try something else over and over again. Um, yeah, I think I forgot where I was headed with that, but. That's okay, that's yeah. okay. Hey, it's okay it's in, this, accepted in, this in this room. group. Totally yeah. accepted, embraced. Yeah, that is embraced. All right, so I'm, I'm going to be uh, jumping around a little bit in the questions that, that I gave you all to, to make sure we cover some bases here. Um, I wanna jump here to Steve. Uh, so many of us, uh, here in the room and, and I'm sure around the world, have been silent partners in your professional journey, investing sometimes our money uh, and definitely our YouTube viewing hours um, <laughs> with likes and subscribes to your growth, to your development and everything. Um, I know this is not the path that you envisioned for yourself when you were younger. Um, and, and even to as recently as, as you know, 2007, 2008, 9, 10, you, know, you still kind of were doing other things. Um, so, and you're gonna be talking about this later in, in our six o'clock um, session here. Uh, if you don't know, he's doing a keynote presentation um, and yes, he will be bringing his cello, one of them, um, one, of them one of the many cellos <laughs> to the stage for you. Um, and he'll be sharing some of his story um, but give us a little bit of an insight here. How old were you when you were diagnosed with ADHD and how did that impact um, the, the, the future self that you, that you saw when you knew that you, you had ADHD, when you were diagnosed? Because that moment for some and for some parents, for some kids and for some parents is kind of pivotal. It can be devastating or it can be, uh, if nothing else, it's eye-opening and kind of wondering what's what's next. Um, so tell us a little bit about that. How old are you and how did well, that impact you? First of all, thank you for all those who have fed my children <laughs> through supporting me. I really do appreciate that. You know, musicians will take all the support we could get. And I really, yes, as a child, I, I envisioned myself as an Apache helicopter pilot. So cellist is pretty much the same thing for the most part. Um, <laughs> Good, good fallback. Maybe, maybe that's a, a video. Yeah, a little more dangerous. <laughs> well, the, the way we do it is more dangerous. In fact, I remember when I was on top of that cliff that you were talking about, we had a helicopter. We, we, no drones existed when we did that video. They, they've, only, they've only been recent. And so this big, massive helicopter was just swimming around us with a camera operator hanging half out of it. And, and I remember I'm closing my eyes just totally into the music, right? And not even... I mean, I was even somewhere else than where we were on top of that thousand foot cliff. And I remember the helicopter blew so much that it lifted my chair ever so slightly off the ground. 
And my eyes popped open, and I realized I was six inches from imminent death. And I was like, this is so cool. <laughs> I mean, it, it, it pulled me out, but I got back into it, of course. But I just, it's, it's I, I, we need to have moments like that in our lives when we're pushing ourselves to do something that is, is it causes fear in us, and then we use fear we, we learn to make friends with it and use it. You know, the stage fright thing is never something to be buried or, or treated like it's something that, that will be inhibitive. It, rather, it should be electric for us. And we should be able to use it and harness it and recognize that it's our body's response to try to be at our best. But getting back to the question, because uh, I love tangents, um, and I do remember the question for the first time in my life, but uh, that's... Should we clap? Yes, yeah, so thank you very much. I appreciate that. <laughs> I'll be here all night. Yeah, so 12 years old was when I was diagnosed. Uh, my dad came to me, and he said... So my dad was a, a real traditionalist. Wanted me to go all the way to master's or PhD, work in the same job my whole life, preferably to be a doctor like he was. That's why I did pre-med, and... My mother was very, very ill with a brain tumor, and so he was juggling six kids, managing her care, trying to get this fledgling ophthalmology practice off the ground. I mean, the guy is a hero to me, and never missed one of my cello lessons. Mm -hmm. And he was so engaged in my life that I had no other path than success because of how engaged he was as my father. We need better fathers. I think, out there. And, and my father is a great example of that. So, um, and I lost him last year, and I'm missing him very much. But he actually recognized that my grades were low, and my friendships were really rocky and not sticky. He came to me, and he said, this is junior high. You know, I mean, this is the armpit of life, right? <laughs> this is a massive ball of insecurity, horrible. And he said, Steve, your grades aren't good, which was really tough for him, and your friendships aren't sticking. What's, my, what's the matter? And I will never forget that moment. I looked at him and I said, Dad, I don't know. All I know is that I'm sitting in a classroom like you all are sitting right here with desks like this. I look around and everybody is focused on the teacher. And all I feel like doing is standing up, running around, and slapping somebody. <laughs> I mean, I still feel like that most of the time. But that's really how I was feeling. And my dad had no idea how to deal with that. So he took me to a psychiatrist. And I remember I hid in the closet before that psychiatrist visit because I was so scared of this guy. I didn't know what he was. He finally, he wrangled me out of the closet persuasively, probably bribed me with something. We went to the office, and I remember the psychiatrist was like, well, let me see your hands. And my hands were like this. I'll never forget. He ran a couple other tests, and he diagnosed me with ADHD, and I walked out of that office in tears because I thought it meant I was broken. They gave me Ritalin. I didn't know what it meant. I didn't know what it was for. I was so offended that I had to have a pill to sustain myself because nobody else was taking pills that I knew of. So I'd go to school and I would throw the pill away and pretend I took it. I, I, I hope that's okay to say because I don't want to advocate for anything. Like This is just my personal story. And But I like how you said it was eye-opening because there was this point where I was like, if my dad is this concerned about me that he's going to take me to this crazy doctor and I'm going to get pills, I mean, I need to figure out what's going on here. And I, have dis I discovered at that point that if I grabbed a hold of music and hyper-focused on my identity through that, I could harness ADHD and turn it into a superpower. And I have never looked back since then, and all of the creativity that I can credit myself with, if, if I can give myself any credit, is due to this wonderful gift of being able to be a divergent thinker as I create, and creating things that the world has never seen before. So I'm very grateful. It was a tough journey, but I have turned that around and channeled it, and I wish I could help, and I, one of my desires is to help kids, one, recognize it's a superpower, and two, find their way to channel it. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, and it is appropriate to, to clap if you feel like clapping. <laughs> no pressure. Sure. Um, it's always good to tell the audience to clap, you know. <laughs> we, we don't have the signs on the side that tell you to clap. <laughs> um, no, th this, is, this has been a, a great discussion. We're getting to the end of our time here, and we do want to allow for, for some questions from, from the audience. 
um, as, as well. So if you have a question, raise your hand. It would be like calling on you, like, like in, in class. Um, can we, Mariana, can you be our mic runner, please? Thank you. That would be awesome. Okay. <laughs> okay. Saw a couple of hands over here. Go ahead and state your name. Uh, my name is Craig Middlemas. Craig Middlemas. Yeah. And I, my son is has ADHD. Um, it's been well. We hope he does. We think he does. I shouldn't say hope, um, but it would be great to know for sure. What's the problem I'm running into? We're running into is that if we want to get a diagnosis from the University of Utah, it's a year wait right now it is it is yeah it's insane and, and so some people are saying that we are over diagnosing ADHD and there are the people who are saying we're under diagnosing ADHD and I feel like there's definitely an under diagnosis going on right now um, we have so much more that we know about it than when I was a kid um, I'm pretty sure I had ADHD as a child and you know um, but I feel like you know, with, with as much more that we know about it, should we be diagnosing it more? Do you feel like it's being overdiagnosed or do you feel like it's being underdiagnosed at this point? Let's hand that to uh, the doctor. So that's the same at universities that do assessment. They do have these long wait lists. Typically they're training facilities. And so getting assessed at a university like UVU, we charge $75 for an ADHD assessment. It's hard to pass that up and go into the community and pay $1,000 for the assessment. Mm -hmm. um, but with my colleagues, we've done some time and motion studies of how long it takes to do an assessment. And so you're paying a, th a, a therapist um, for eight to eight or more hours of their time and um, to do this um, testing and then writing the report, interviews and collecting collateral uh, information from families. But my card's up there. If, if anybody wants to grab it and email me, I'll send you our community resources that we refer students to. They're somewhat vetted um, rather than just a cold call. Mm -hmm. um, diagnosis, I think, is both under and over. Um, it kind of depends on uh, what you're talking about. Um, since COVID, then diagnosis has gone up about 13% uh, overall, uh, men and or, uh, for the general population, but it's rising much faster in females. It's much lower diagnosed in females, unfortunately. Yeah. It's uh, seen as mm -hmm. anxiety, seen as uh, um, shyness, you know, mm -hmm. masking, all these kinds of things, mm -hmm. instead of, yeah, dreaminess, sexist things, really, because mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. impulsivity in a, in a boy can look like boldness and courage and all this other stuff, and in a girl, it has other labels. So. Mm. Um, so it's rising like 33% or something like mm -hmm. that in females, the diagnosis rate. Mm -hmm. um, but I still think it's underdiagnosed in being able to catch it fast enough, soon enough, so that treatment can occur. There is a lot of still negativity, uh, negative stigma, yeah. where parents don't want to admit that um, their kids have mm -hmm. a, a neurodevelopmental disorder. Mm -hmm. Well, that sounds really scary, right? Mm -hmm. And Really, it just means that we're not neurotypical, which sounds boring, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, yeah. um, can, can I add yeah, something? What else did I miss? Um, uh, there's also a lot of difficulty in populations um, cult with cultural differences. Um, we see a lot of underdiagnosis in um, people of color, for example. Um, and then in terms of the research that's out there on ADHD, less than 1% of it is in women and girls. It's really bad. And so we are seeing a surge of women and girls mm -hmm. being diagnosed. And we are, I don't know if anyone pays attention, but socials, TikTok, Instagram, we're seeing a lot of, a lot of neurodivergence pop up there. And in some ways it can be a negative, but in other ways it's a positive because you're having people who might not have any other outlet or resource to recognize, hey, that sounds like me. Maybe this is what's going on. So yeah. But still, women are still underdiagnosed, for sure. Yeah, and I'll have sure. to get your contact information because we can help you out, for sure. That's wonderful. Thank you. Next question, uh, state your name, please. My name is Shad Woodland. Um, I don't have a question yet in my head, but I, more of a, you guys have got my gears turning. Um, I, my, so to, to answer this, this brother's question, I think it's way overdiagnosed personally. 
Uh, my dad was the uh, auto shop teacher here at the local high school from the beginning to the end of the program. Um, as you can probably imagine, all of his students, not all, the majority of his students were those that excelled more doing rather than just sitting, right? right? Sitting and waiting and watching. Sure. I, I, I believe very strongly that the reason that that's way over-diagnosed is because um, the, the world has turned more academic and the world has turned more sedentary. I think, um, I think this, this group of people that like to do and move is, are the movers and shakers of society. I think, just like it was mentioned, this is their superpower. This is, this is, this is society that's changing and these people, I, I don't know because I didn't live 100 years ago, but I suspect 100 years ago there were far, far more ADHDs out there, right? These are the movers of the world. And so I just couldn't help but think, and I guess here's my question, maybe you could just respond or comment back, is if this is a, really a question about education reform, right? Like largely that's what we're talking about, right? Sort of a different learning environment. So our, our organization addresses that. And I'm wondering, I mean, I see some individuals up here that have essentially conformed to that environment but likely you would have succeeded much more in a different learning environment. So um, it's a hard question, but um, how can we change our education system is our, my question, I suppose. <laughs> that, 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 is a, that is a very broad uh, question. Oh man, I just I had know, a long we might need another conversation, conversation on that. Um, Go last ahead, night Josh. I, I called up a good friend of mine who's a school psychologist and we, man, we talked for about three hours just about yeah, <laughs> some of the ideas that were in the questions here. Yeah. Um, because then it, it does get really tricky, right? I, I think um, to answer both of you, is Chad and Craig, right? Um, the, the big thing for me is talking with teachers and saying, the kid is here, and here is how they are behaving. What are you gonna do about it? And um, with, a, with or without a diagnosis, because sometimes you're on that waiting list for a year, but the kid is still working in this space in this way. Um, so how can I empower myself or uh, my teachers or my teams to meet that kid where they are? Um, with uh, love and compassion. And, and I think that the big thing there too is that I, I've always seen education, it, it is fundamentally and will always be a two-pronged enterprise. Um, because I have people <coughs> ask me all the time, well, should I go to this school or should I go to that school or should I go to that school? And honestly, like most, most kids, except in like really extreme cases, can succeed in most schools if they have support at home. And um, the way that we, I, th I think the, the biggest thing that's happening right now is we are seeing a lot more capacity and willingness on the parts of uh, not just teachers and parents to actually communicate with each other more about what those needs are. Um, I, I had an experience when I was teaching uh, fourth grade, I was uh, out in West Valley and I was teaching uh, adjacent to uh, several trailer parks. And this was a Title I area where, I mean, like kids could literally walk out their door and say, this house sells this and this house sells that and this house sells that. Um, and I had parents that were in and out of jail. Like kids had aces after aces after aces af after them in this environment. And um, I remember coming to school one day and I had this one kid who uh, was, um, really impulsive and hyperactive and he didn't have a diagnosis or anything of that sort but I, I can but he was always at school early before any of the teachers pulled in he was always out in front of the school and he was waiting to come in because his parents both worked and they just dropped him off and whether it was rain shine hot or cold he was out there and I remember getting there one morning and he was drinking a liter of Mountain Dew and I was like hey there I'm gonna call him Billy hey there Billy what you doing there? <laughs> and I, I kept uh, food in my desk, just so like I, I just always had oatmeal and granola bars and things for kids to eat because I knew a lot of them came to school without breakfast. And um, and our school at that time didn't have a breakfast program. And uh, he said, "Well, I'm eating my breakfast." I was like, "Oh, okay." My mom said I could have it. She wants me to stay awake. And <laughs> uh, to. Uh, and, and I believe that 
he, he was telling the truth. His mom wanted him to stay awake. She felt like school was an important priority um, and wanted him to succeed, but she didn't have the background knowledge in even just general nutrition to provide the pathway forward for, the, for that child. Now, luckily, I had a good enough relationship with that family where I called him up and I said, hey, you know, I saw Billy here this morning and he said that you gave him some Mountain Dew. You know, she's like, and she confirmed, yeah, I wanted him to stay awake in school. I said, okay, my, my sister happens to be a nutritionist. And so, uh, uh, and I was able to set up a meeting. I said, I'd love to talk to you a little bit more about, I, I can see that this is an honest and good desire that you have. And um, after that discussion that we set up a meeting with my sister, she was really kind to just like jump on a call with us and we talked about that and that parent made some shifts and then Billy, in his case, his uh, ADHD type behaviors disappeared because what he really needed was better nutrition. Mm -hmm. And that is not always the case, but in his case it was. And then I've also had other students that, yes, th this is the way that their brain is wired and this is the way that things are, are going to work. But the question was for me, he's in my class, how am I gonna meet him where he's at? And if there's anything that I can provide in that way, and I think that those partnerships between schools and parents and providing knowledge on both sides like, the teachers need to learn about these neurodivergent kids, and we also need to provide pathways forward for parents to also learn about those situations and uh, be empowered to serve their kids in the best way possible, too, because they all, they all do. They really do. Thank you. So we have time for, for, for one more question, um, and, and there is a hand back here. Um, yeah, if you want to go ahead and take that back there. I'm, I'm just going to overlay this. It's, uh, I think in this world, and with regards to, to diagnosis, it's not really a question of diagnosis or not diagnosis. Uh, a diagnosis is a, is a, is a point-in-time assessment, and, and it gives you a window into what you've experienced to that point in your life, but it is not a, a sentence to this is how you should spend the rest of your life. It's kind of a beginning. Just like a diagnosis of, of cancer or, or a broken leg, uh, it's okay, it's broken, what do you do next? Well, we take care of the brokenness, we treat it, you go through some therapy, you, 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 you learn some things about yourself, you become, and you come out stronger a lot of times on the other side. And uh, so we could ask the same question, do we under or over diagnose broken bones? Well, maybe both like you were saying, and, and I kind of want to give, give it back to you a second before taking this last question. Yeah, so ADHD is a neurodevelopmental disorder, which means there are some differences in the brain of people with ADHD. Now, we're not at the point where we can give someone a CAT scan and diagnose ADHD from looking at the brain, but we can see enough correlational changes in the brain and levels of dopamine, um, size and activity of brain structures to say this, that these things really correlate with the diagnosis of ADHD. I don't think, we've got this fat manual, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, and every page is full of lists of symptoms. And if somebody has enough of those symptoms and meets criteria, then we give them a diagnosis. But if the environment accommodates, like you're saying, if we wouldn't have to give people diagnosis of ADHD if the environment accommodates. And the more things like the arts get taken out of the schools, the less the environment is accommodating. And so we're gonna see an increase yeah. in diagnosis. Yeah. Thank you. Hey, last question. Please state your name and give uh, a question. My name is Maroney, and yes, there aren't as many people of color, as you would say, that get diagnosed. And I just wanted to mention really quick, that's also part of our culture. I'm Hispanic. Mm. They don't really believe in mental health issues. <laughs> Like my parents don't like to talk about it, nobody likes to talk about it, so there is the culture itself that also affects the willingness to go to a doctor and all that. Um, I discovered it during college, so um, that, was, that was fun. Um, my question is, uh, what happened to ADD? Because I identify more with that ADHD. I heard now it's not a thing, now it's all ADHD. And reason being, I actually agree with the gentleman that talked about education reform. Nate knows, like, I'm just like, tear it all down and start over um, because that's just how I think 
it would accommodate for people with different preferences, different learning abilities. Um, but yeah, that's kind of like my question is, because I didn't have that urge to go and slap people in class, but I also wasn't in the class. <laughs> I was somewhere else thinking about other things. Or like the teacher would say something that would inspire me and then I'd create this little world. And so I definitely identify with those symptoms of ADHD. I'm just curious if that is still an emphasis anymore and like is that still being diagnosed, et cetera? We all got put into one ball. So it's all ADHD now, but we can diagnose into three different subtypes of uh, hyperactive type, which a lot of people that were diagnosed with ADD uh, relate with that. And then there's um, inattentive type and then there's combined type where they meet criteria for both in a, a way that impairs their functioning. Um, so pretty quick answer. And, we're, and sorry, we're even hearing and seeing um, language changing from it being a subtype to it being a presentation um, from this, the research that I've taught people um, <laughs> in uh, one of my jobs. Um, and, uh, and we're seeing that they're even thinking of, of maybe labeling the um, hyperactive impulsive presentation potentially something different. Um, so it's just, it's just really interesting. And we tend to see inattentive in like women and girls more often, whereas we tend to see hyperactive impulsive presentation in boys and men. Um, and we often see that some of the external hyperactive um, tendencies may kind of phase out as people age. Um, and so that's why a lot of people get diagnosed with combined presentation or combined type later on even if maybe they aren't combined type, maybe they really are hyperactive. So it's just, there's so much change still coming, but. Interesting, yeah. thank you, Marianne. Could yeah. you uh, bring that mic back up here? This is the last question, and, and to give it a, a one sentence answer, um, uh, if, if you can. If not, elaborate what you need to. Okay, here's the last question. One, what's the top thing you think we can do as a community of educators innovators, healthcare professionals, parents, people in the community to have a positive impact in the short and long term in the lives of our ch children. What's the one thing that we can do better? I'll, I'll bring that disruptive word back, right? We need to be disruptive innovators. And to answer your question, Stephen, it's we need to educate these uh, teachers and, and these people, uh, you know, you mentioned that not all of them really know how to deal with some of these situations. And the more we educate and train these educators on how they can handle these different situations with these different individuals will really go a long way. So that's a short and long-term thing because it's, it's just a opening up the lines of communication, providing training. I think it's an awesome idea to, like, in your school community, like, create an event where these teachers come to where they can learn about the challenges that these students face yeah. and ways that they can really make their lives as a teacher better and easier and have a massive impact on the child. We love free PD. <laughs> we love it. Professional development for anybody that doesn't know. Free PD. Any other panelists would like to just I was going to I was going to say just the when I I've I've a thousand performances at this point, I don't know how many it is, and I spend two or three minutes during the concert talking directly to the kids that are gifted with ADHD. And I say, if you have this gift, if you're part of my cool club, you're gonna do incredible things with it. Destigmatization and positivity, and, and, but with sincerity and authenticity is number one. Number two is, I've had enough of STEM, it needs to be STEAM. Well, you stole it. <laughs> <I'm sorry>. <laughs> <laughs> stole the thunder. No, and, well, and, that, and that's the thing. He's like, oh, man, we got to get arts and movement yeah. back forefront of schools. I, like I mean, like, movement, yeah. I like uh, well, I'd like, I'd, I have steam had, with two M's. <laughs> yeah. Steam. 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 Mm -hmm. steam, mm -hmm. <laughs> steam. Um, because, I mean, that, that includes not just PE, but dance and yeah. sports and yeah. All of these different things that, that can be a part of that school environment, for sure. Dr. Cheney? Sure. Um, any skill that's going to stick is going to come from the connection. And I think that's what's great about what Steve was saying with uh, his concert, where he takes two minutes to connect with the kids in the audience. And 
and so that emotional point. As far as, you know, the one thing I wanted to leave with people that is just a helpful tool, uh, something I heard from Dr. David Knoll, who's a, a speaker for ADHD, and he says, um, he, he asks every client, what's the hardest part for you? And then he also, um, when they've done something well, he wants to know how exactly did you do that? And those two questions are so helpful in whether you're helping a family member or a patient, client, whatever, um, to help them really analyze what they what works for them and see how you can generalize that and then include the connection and the emotion components so that they're committed to it. Yeah. So. That's great. Yeah. 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 Thank you so much. Oh, so he, oh, sorry, request to say it one more time from Craig. Craig. And how exactly did you do that? You want to be able to analyze the things they succeed at so that you can say, now how can we take that skill and incorporate it to focus it in class or whatever else? Can you do an example off the cuff? Of how exactly did yeah. you do that? Oh, no, 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 like somebody's answer of those two, you mean? Yeah, that would be, that'd be great. So, um, so what's the hardest part? Uh, often it's getting ready, getting myself out the door in the morning. And then... Um, when, when they've succeeded at something, that one's harder like for me to do off the cuff for some reason. But, um, well, you could ask, you could ask one varied. of us. Just yeah. ask one of us. How exact? Well, yeah, I mean, go for it. Answer oh. those questions. What's the hardest part? <laughs> Self-doubt for me. Uh -huh. Getting 100%. on stage, making mistakes, and trying to stay in the game and not, not defeating myself. Okay, and then I go to, well, when are you in the zone? When do you feel like you're a total success? When, I'm, when I feel the spirit of the music and I do what Mozart says when I'm in the space between the notes instead of on the notes themselves. And then how that, exactly do you do that? So, I, so I, I focus on the joy and not the toxic perfectionism and the connection with the audience. And if the audience is not feeling it, this has been a great gift for me to discover this. I play to the one. Okay. Because so, of 3,000 people that are all folding their arms and like I wasted my money on this concert, <laughs> which you can sometimes tell yourself, you say... There's got to be one person out there that needs what I'm playing right now, and I'm going to connect to that one person, and it changes my whole psyche. And when I when I and this is a very simple thing, and this is a great answer. I love I love this question. When I make a mistake, I used to grimace, and my dad pointed that out to me, because that's what was going on in my head. I started to smile every time I made a mistake. I smile a lot in my shows. <laughs> a lot of it has to do with the joy of the music. Yeah. But every time I make a mistake, I smile. And it has changed everything for me. And so I try to make that. I, I love how you say, well, how do we make that? How do we portableize that? <laughs> That's not even a word, but let's make it one. How do we make that portable so I can transport that to other things? And I do the same thing. I just laugh at myself and smile at my mistakes. And it's changed my world. Yeah. So if I understand you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. When this ovation dies down, we can continue. Yep. You, so you answered the question, right? That yeah. you started with what was hard, yeah. and you're saying like, oh, if I do this where I thrive, if I put that into that self-doubt, yeah. then it's helpful. The gold standard for treating ADHD is CBT therapy and medication. And um, I didn't have real strong values around those things uh, five years ago, but the more I'm in the research and listening to the researchers, then I do have strong value, or I have opinions about those things. And I've also gained a strong opinion for mindfulness, which is always reminding you to mm. bring your attention back. The mm. key isn't to be in nirvana for 10 minutes. The key is to, every time you get distracted, bring your attention back to what you're doing. Mm. And that's a real strength. Where did I, I'm lost. I talk too much. <laughs> I, I loved that exercise. I, though. I that was it. fun to watch that happen, actually. I think that was yeah. really fun. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for that question. I think one thing's clear to, to me from the conversation today, from the questions today, is that we do need to do more to understand kids as individuals. Whether that means fixing more of what we're working with now or completely disrupting the entire education space, it's all centered, it all needs to be centered on actually providing what each child needs. And we all, we all know that kids are not created equal, they don't learn at the same pace, but we continue to put them into the same classroom and teach them the same way. And we try to find accommodations. We have disruptive teachers who say, 
I'm going to get them out of the classroom and take them out and give them a brain break and get them to move, get that gross motor movement and, and bring them back into the room. And there are programs like that, um, but we need to unite our efforts around providing what our kids actually need. And that starts with understanding our kids where they are. And I think that's the common thread through all of this discussion today. Thank you so much for being on the panel today. And thank you for attending. Uh, I hope it's been worth it. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.